The music world moves fast. Want to stay up to date on the latest albums and get in-depth examinations with the artists? Check out Consequence of Sound, the podcast. Bite-sized album reviews for the music fan on the go who wants to stay in the know and much more. Subscribe to the series on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider and let the writers of Consequence of Sound steer you right. Check it out at consequenceofsound.net slash COS podcast. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org, Consequence of Sound, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Take a moment before we get into the interview here to hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening to. If you're checking out the podcast somewhere, or if you're on YouTube, or if you're on Spotify, hit the follow button there, subscribe however you can, and uh, so you can keep up with all the interviews that we put out every single week. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest, Lucinda Williams, one of the all-time greatest songwriters. And we're jumping back in time to talk about the 20th anniversary of uh, of a pretty landmark record, Car Wheels on a Gravel Road. We'll get into the ins and outs of it, especially that song, Drunken Angel, that was written about Blaze Foley, who now has a movie made about his life, as well as the... uh, the problems that went into making the record. We'll also get into her latest release. It's called Vanished Gardens. It's a Americana jazz collaboration with Charles Lloyd. There's also a little bit of talk on her upcoming 40th anniversary year and the memoirs she has planned to release in 2020. And I do a little geeking out over the record Little Honey, which turns 10 years old this year. It's Kyle Meredith with Lucinda Williams. Hi. There's actually a few projects I want to ask you about, some in the present, some in the past. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll start with the past, because I know that's been on your mind a little bit this year with the 20th anniversary of, uh, of Car Wheels. Uh, mm-hmm. How's that one sounding to you these days? Well, I mean, I don't sit around and listen to it. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, <laughs> I just, you know, the way I embrace it is when I go out on the road and, you know, perform the songs from it and everything so i i just go by where there are i feel like the songs are still standing the test of time and they are you know so it's drunken angel is constantly on the set list pretty much you know (laughs) of course now that that movie's out you know called blaze so yeah it kind of gives it a a bit more relevancy again i mean not that that song was never relevant because it's a classic song but 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 as mm-hmm. you, you know, I, I did want to bring that up, you know, here we have a movie uh, starring Ethan Hawke. Would, mm-hmm. uh, were you involved w- with that at all, having known uh, Blaze Foley much, or, or did they did they kind of clue you in on on what was happening before it started? No, I mean, you know, I heard about that it was getting made and everything, and it was going to come out. I'm friends with Charlie Sexton, and of course, he played the role of Towns in it, and we were talking and kind of laughing about that. <laughs> You know, he said he, he got a call from, because he, he and Ethan are friends, and he said, got a call from Ethan and said, you know, I'm doing this song about Blaze, and, and guess what? I want you to play Blaze's, I want you to play Towns. But, I you know, just little bits and pieces. But, no, I didn't, I wasn't consulted or anything. It's got to be interesting to... You know, just I mean, you knew these people. You you, you knew Blaze. Uh, I'm I'm guessing you probably knew Towns pretty well too. Not well. Okay. No. I didn't know either of them well. You know, it's hard to get to know somebody like Towns or Blaze. You know, because I mean, half the time I was around. You know, they were fucked up so much of the time. To be honest, I mean, you know, I'm just being honest about it. I was I was mesmerized by Towns, as I think a lot of people were, but. He was kind of a guy's guy. There was kind of a boys club, and I was just a newbie and just starting out. And so we weren't like Guy Clark's wife, Susanna, was good for instance, talents. Yeah. You know, like they would talk on the phone all the time. But I wasn't, we weren't like close friends. I saw him play, and I mean, I was aware of Towns' music way before I met him, right. you know, in the early 70s and all that. So. There's a lot of mythology oh, sure. there, yeah. you know, surrounding him and surrounding Blaze and all of that. So, I mean, the Blaze thing, you know, he was a guy who was playing around Austin and Houston when I was living there back then. And Gurf Morlicks 
played with Gurf, you know, worked a lot with him. And, of course, Gurf ended up being in my band when I first moved out to L.A. and co-produced the Rough Trade album and the, you know, Sweet Old World album and started work with me on the Car Wheels album. So the place, you know, it's just like a lot of ways, I, a lot of the time, you know, writing a song about someone that was kind of from a distance, you know. And then to... um. Like I said, you know, to to kind of be part of the uh, the mythology yourself, you know, with, with this song sort of taking the life that it did. I mean, uh, like I said, it's a classic for a reason, but you know, it's it is interesting to see the full on because outside of that that scene, you know, he wasn't a no name. <laughs> you know? No, yeah, <laughs> you know, nobody knew it. Well, you know, I mean, one of the things I read was, you know, I mean, he was so self sabotaging mm-hmm. is the thing, and. That's always kind of pissed me off, you know, about somebody when they do that. You know, there's somebody with so much talent like that. But talent is like that, too. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, I saw him get drunk and fall off the stage and stuff. And, and yet, you know, he wrote these magnificent songs. But, yeah, Blaze, I was reading somewhere where, you know, he his first break, apparently one of his first big breaks came when Kinky Freeman asked him to go out and open up a tour, go on tour with him. And apparently Blaze was so freaked out and scared shitless about the whole thing. He got so fucked up the first night on stage that he got fired oh, right away, you know. Yeah. Well, you'd, um, you know, you mentioned also Sweet Old World in there. And last time you and I were talking that we were talking about the anniversary of that, uh, which was just last year, the uh, the 25th anniversary of, of Sweet Old World and uh, this Sweet Old World mm-hmm. re-recording of it. At the time, I mean, you had come off of a critical high w- with that album. To go into Car Wheels, you know, it- it's now a, a well-told story about the uh, the different versions that went into it and, and-, yeah. and scrapping it and re-recording it. But was thank you for not having. <laughs> I just did an interview right before about ten minutes ago. Yeah, had to go through the whole thing all I... over again about. <laughs> Anyway, I didn't, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's okay. We know oh, yeah. that story well. Well, I mean, it's easy to find anyway. Yeah. What I, what I do wonder though is, you know, as you're trying to get the album right, and and having those moments, you know, that that now in hindsight are probably, you know, were the luxury that made this album what it was. I mean, how much pressure was there for you personally to just get it right, to to have the proper follow up to to Sweet Old World? Well, the thing is, you know. I wasn't really completely happy with the sound of Sweet Old World because I would hear other people's albums and I would go, you know, I wish my album sounded more like that or I wish my vocals sounded more a certain way, you know, kind of thing. And and I realized if I was going to continue along the same line that with the same, all the same people and the same, you know, with I'd done the Rough Trade album with Gurf and I did the Sweet Old World album with Gurf with the same band and everything no other outside producers, you know, mm-hmm. and I felt like, okay, I'm going to, when I went in to make Car Worlds, I didn't want to make another Sweet Old World. It, something had to change. Something had to move forward. And really the catalyst for that came when I had just moved to Nashville and Steve Earle invited me, you know, to come in and sing on his album on that song, You're Still Standing There. And I loved the way he gave me a copy of his Rough Mixes for that album. And I compared it to, at that point, we had Rough Mixes for Car Wheels, you know, the original roughs that I did with Gurf, and some of which I wasn't happy with. And I wanted to recut some of the tracks that Gurf didn't want to, you know. So we were butting heads already. And so then I heard Steve's album, and he said, well, you want to come in here and recut a couple of, of the tracks? And I was just going to do a couple of things. And but then it sounded so great, you know. Yeah. We ended up. But anyway, I've told this story a million times. <laughs> I was but, thinking, like, we, we, even with but, that, we couldn't avoid telling a little bit of the story. <laughs> it's still hard to. Do. I know, and you know, but the thing with Sweet Old World, it, it kind of fell in the cracks too, mm-hmm. in between the Road Trade album and Car Wheels and everything. Yeah, I um, I was uh, reading a, a recent interview too. It had both you and, and Steve talking on it, and I I was surprised. I don't think I'd ever knew Steve talking about uh, a little bit of the influence that hip hop had when he was kind of guiding a a few of the songs and I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I can hear that now. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on Joy, I mean, he actually, 
you know, Steve hadn't been out of prison that long, actually, when, you know, when I went in to sing on his album and everything. And he'd been, he was really into a couple of hip hop artists. And when we were recording Joy, he wanted to me to sing the vocal through this kind of some sort of thing where it made my voice sound, I don't know, what it's sort of, not a megaphone, but some kind of contraption or something or other. And I was kind of like, no, no, I can't do that. You know, now I would probably try it, but I use that as a, a little bit of a jumping around point here, but too, because you know it's it's odd sometimes to think about you know the 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 type of music that you were doing at that point, you know, mixing with something like hip hop. But but here you are, just recently, you know, the release this year is called Vanished Gardens, where you team up with Charles Lloyd, and you're doing that with with jazz. Uh, mm-hmm. This time around, which I know, like the obvious question is, how outside of the box was this for you? Because I know you're a jazz fan. You know, you've you've name checked Coltrane yeah. and songs and everything. So, uh, was it a really different world for you, or did it fit in? It really fit in. I mean, the thing is, it lifted for me. Well, the first time I played with Charles is when. Because, see, I got to know Charles through the work I did with uh, Greg Lease and Bill Frizzell. They were both working with Charles, and so they played in Santa Monica, I mean Santa Barbara. And Greg Lease was, was playing, and he invited us to the show. And um, so that's when I first got to meet Charles. And then we played at Royce Hall and invited him to sit in. And Charles came up, just him. And set in on joy and a couple of the songs, and I was just, you know, completely, it just elevated everything for me. I've always wanted to have more other kinds of instruments with me in a live setting, you know, like keyboards and violin, and I love the string sound, you know, like the stuff the Rolling Stones did with strings. But, you know, I can't, it's, you know, hard to afford to be able to do that you know be able to afford to do that so you know and i never i never had anybody like charles lloyd and he just fit right in because his history is so varied too his musical history you know he played with the beach everybody from the beach boys to muddy waters to Jimi hendrix right. so he's not your typical you know jazz cat you know he's yeah. He transcends the label, and I, I guess I kind of do too, as far as whatever kind of music I do. That's what I was thinking. You know, like um, e- even even when you're th- talking just, you know, I'll, I'll widely use that term Americana roots music. You know, mm-hmm. why does it, it like today's standards of no genre? Because we are in a period where genre seems less than less important than, than we ever have been in the past, when it was very strictly, you know, you're you're in this box, you're in this box, but. But even with that, mm-hmm. why why does this still feel like strange bedfellows? You know, when you're when you're talking your world yeah. and 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 his world, why is that? Well, I'm not sure, other than just the business side of it all, because that's what really started setting the terms for the different genres. Right, was when they decided, you know, they needed to market things. The way to market things would be to have different genres, you know, and okay, this is this kind of music, and, you know, radio jumped in. Remember when radio played all different kinds of styles of music on the mm-hmm. same station? Mm-hmm. And then all then as, as the years went on, you know, that got less and less, and so everything just got segregated, you know, this one style from another, from another, from another. Like, I was just now reading an article in Rolling Stone about why these this certain – kind of style now that it involves Jamaican music, how it's been hard for it to come over here or be, become popular over here and mm-hmm. like why is that and everything. More like world music more. Right. So I mean I don't know, you know, just like you, we don't know the answers for everything. Why? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well why does a radio play more of such as such kind of music? But that's the only thing I could figure out. Like when you I mean I started seeing that happening in a kind of different way, a parallel to what you're talking about. When I would go into a record store and my album, I had to figure out where my album was going to be. Right. Was it going to be in the folk bin, the country bin, or the rock bin? And you know, then there are a few times where they it would be in every in all three of them because mm-hmm. they didn't know where to put it. I, I love how it it came together on this though. Like I'll even. You know, the, the first time we hear you on the record is with Dust, which is a recent song for you, uh, comparatively. 
and it's such a great I don't know freak out at the end you know whatever they're doing how how that whole yeah. song plays out and, and how much of that I mean do you just kind of set back and let that happen is there any direction from you totally spontaneous on my part I mean I was just yeah you know we ran through the song whatever song it was going to be a couple of times and I didn't know my big biggest challenge was. I mean, I hadn't even played with Charles that much, with his band that much, when we went in to do that album. You know, we hadn't had that much stuff really to go on or anything. I mean, he liked, he was familiar with my material, and, you know, we'd done a few shows together, and they went so well. The first one was when we did a show together in Santa Barbara, and we did Masters of War. See, there, there is an example, right? There are Masters of War. I find out he knows the song, and I'm going, God, I used to do that song when I was 16, back in the 60s, during the whole big protest time. Mm -hmm. And Charles was already playing it. So, I mean, how many jazz cats do you know who know Master of the War? So we're connecting over that. And, in fact, that show at Santa Barbara where we performed that song, Don Waz was there, who, you know, was the executive producer of the album later. And he recorded uh, the this, this stuff that night, and he was so blown away by our version of Master of the War that he took it and mixed it and everything and played it on his radio show during the, I think this was right before the election or something. But anyway, that's what started the whole idea of us going to the studio was we did a few shows like that together and it really went over and I think I got off the subject now. I'm kind no, of it's okay. To I actually like where play. you're going be- because because that reminded me, you know, when when, when I was listening back to Car Wheels uh, over the last few days and everything, uh, I, I probably centered in on concrete and barbed wire more than I ever had in the past because it was always this great song, but now when I listen to it, it, it means quite a bit more when you're talking yeah. about a wall that divides us. You know, if it's a relationship and relationships That's are true. politics and politics That's are human good. issues, yeah. Like, That's a good point. I actually wrote that song after the Ber- Berlin Wall came down. So, so it 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 did have a bit of a literal meaning to it, uh, mm-hmm. e- even then. Cause that's right. That's what I'd wondered, like you know, because because a lot of these songs they could just as easy be a relationship song, you know, a, a, of something that's happening. But yeah, I, I kind of wondered. Well, that's it. what I, I like to write like that, you know, where it's kind of hidden a little bit, not hidden, but sort of, you know, use those kind of metaphors. So, you know, it's, it could be one thing, but it's, I'm wor- I've got a bunch of songs right now I'm working on that some of them are going to be more obvious than <laughs> who it's about, you know. I mean, the whole, well, you know, we used to call them topical songs, like the kind of stuff. I always wanted to be able to write those kinds of songs like Bob Dylan had, like, you know, like Masters of War, the times they are changing and with God on our side and all that. All of my favorites. Those are harder. Those are harder to write. Though, yeah. Those kinds of songs. They're a lot more challenging. What? Just to get back to, for a second, because I want to finish. The, I didn't want to leave people hanging because they're. <laughs> but what I was going to say after you asked me about when we were in the studio with Charles and the gods and everything, and you know, speaking of which, I mean, his r- rhythm section is just out of this world. I mean, you know, they could play anything and everything, but. My biggest challenge is probably because I didn't want to interrupt, you know, like Charles would go off and, you know, be doing the solo thing. And I'd be in the vocal booth kind of thinking to myself, you know, well, should I come in here or should I give him more time or, you know, so you can hear where, like, I'll come in to sing the next thing. And he's kind of still going a little bit, (laughs) you know, I've become more confident since then. Now when we play live, I, I kind of look, I make more eye contact with Charles and he kind of, he kind of looks over to me like, okay, like, cause we don't really, nobody talks about like how long is the solo going to be kind of thing, yeah. you know? So it's a whole different kind of experience. Well, like I said, I, I love how it kind of came through with all of that. You know, you're mentioning writing songs, I guess, depending on how you look at it this year, next year is sort of your 40th anniversary in, in the business. And, do we? Do, do you think there'll be an album that kind of goes along with that, or is that even on your yeah. mind in that way? Well, absolutely. I mean, I've got these songs. I've got several songs. Right, I've finished some new ones, and then I've got some other stuff I'm working on. You know, a lot of 
different songs in different stages of progress. So anyway, yeah. No, Tom and I were just talking about that yesterday. That's, I mean, it's a great milestone. That's you know, most people don't make it ten years in this business. So to do forty, that's amazing. I know. I was saying that same thing. I said, "Well, I'm still touring my ass off." Right. I mean, you know, we just got back a couple of days ago from our the, the last our last show was in Greenville, Mississippi, at a music festival. Yes. Uh, we had like a fourteen hour travel day getting back to LA. Oof. <laughs> from Greenville. <laughs> That's rough. We had to drive. We had to, they, they don't even have, there's no major airport there. It's one of the few towns still left that don't have a freeway going into the town. It oh. doesn't have a freeway going in, which makes it a really special place, but which also makes it, you know, <laughs> difficult for traveling. So we had to drive to Jackson to go to get to the Jackson airport, wait there a couple hours, fly from Jackson to Dallas, Deal with the nightmare of DFW. Right. Have a over two hour layover at DFW, and finally come in, to get into LA. It was like the traveling thing is rough. Yeah. Sometimes you know flying. Right. I don't mind getting on the tour bus. You know, just jump on the tour bus, and I have my little home on wheels. You know, but I'm doing it. You know, I mean, I'm still. People are. I mean, what else am I going to do? <laughs> Am I supposed to retire now? I mean, you know, I don't, you know, I have to remind myself how, that I'm 65. And, like, I guess if I had, had been working a regular nine-to-five job, I guess I'd be retired. But Tony Bennett's 92, you know. He, he's still singing when he can. So it's, <laughs> that's, that's the but bar anyway, these days. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm grateful, though. You yeah. know, I was just telling we were talking about that too yesterday, you know. I said, Well, when he told me I had these interviews coming up and I've got a couple tomorrow and I said, Well, they still wanna to talk to me and you know <laughs> people still wanna see me play and Absolutely. And uh and yeah, I know you got I a guess great I'm doing something right. Yeah, I know you got a great story to tell too. And and I heard that the memoirs are gonna be out what in uh in a couple years, uh hopefully. Is that the, is that the plan still? Yeah. I want to know that story. I want. I want to know that whole story from. I get. Yeah. I get my little. My little peek holes. My little snippets when, when we get these interviews. But uh, I'm looking forward to that. That's really fun. I'll just toss this in here at the end. I don't have any questions for it. Um. All like, but I'd like to throw a happy anniversary to Little Honey as well. Ten years old this year. It's probably thank you the one that is most important to me in your catalog uh, because of my life around the time and coming out of it and. Oh, God, I, it still sounds so good, that one. I'm, I'm still such a really? fan of it. Yeah, I love wow. it. That album kind of sort of got kind of lost, I think, a little bit, you know, because right before Blessed and in between West and Blessed. Mm. And people, I'm glad to hear you say that because people don't mention that album that much. Oh, man, that's a, I could do a whole interview just on that one probably. I mean, you, you know, wow. even those big rock Thanks. songs with with real love and Honey Bee, and of course that uh, that really fun cover of uh, of uh, ACDC at the end. I mean, there's so many yeah. great moments of that record. It really is. It still stands up. It really does. Thank you. Yeah. So, Lucinda, thank you so much uh, for taking the time today uh, for all the anniversaries. I, I really enjoying the, the 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 jazz record as well, and I can't wait to hear what these uh, these new songs and these topical songs are going to sound like. Well, there I've got a couple of love songs in there too. I still, you know, <laughs> nice balance. I still have, I've still got stuff up my sleeve. Well, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> thank you so much, and uh, and we'll okay. see you around. Okay, thank you. All right, take care. Okay, you too. Bye. And thanks so much to Lucinda Williams, the uh, 20th anniversary of Car Wheels on the Gravel Road, 10th anniversary of Little Honey, and of course the new record with Charles Lloyd called Vanished Gardens. Uh, if you haven't already, please do take that moment to hit the subscribe button right now. If you're checking out the podcast somewhere or if you're listening on YouTube or on Spotify, you can hit follow there, subscribe however you can. After that, head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern and where you'll also find some bonus episodes of this series. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.